closing curtains. There we go. All right, we've got about 50% left on the progress bar. All right, and we are live. So hello and welcome everyone to the University of Tennessee College of Social Work Generating Justice speaking series. Generating Justice was launched in June of 2020 following the aftermath of George Floyd's death. Generating Justice is a forum for addressing recent and ongoing events. Generating Justice provides a platform for showing up for racial justice and strengthening our community. Today, we present the finer speaker for this academic year. At the conclusion of today's discussion, viewers will be asked to post questions using the comments section on Facebook. I'm excited to introduce our moderator, Carmen Reese Foster. Ms. Foster is the field education coordinator for the online MSSW program and assistant professor of practice. Carmen is also the founder and faculty advisor for the Coalition of Black Social Workers. The coalition connects black social work students the professional social workers of color for the purposes of engaging, connecting, and empowering our next generation of Black social workers. Carmen is also the founder of and the chair of the Tennessee Statewide Field Consortium. She is also pursuing a DSW from the University of Alabama School of Social Work. Carmen, I'm now passing you the mic to introduce our prestigious guests. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Um, it is such a pleasure to be with everybody today. Um, put your seat belts on. We're in for a fantastic uh, 45 minutes with Dr. Eddie Glaude. Um, it is beyond uh, my great privilege and pleasure to share this space with you and have a conversation. Um, I will read his bio. Oh. Dr. Glaude is an American academic. He is the James S. McConnell Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where he is also the chair of the Center for African American Studies and the chair of the Department of African American Studies. He's a busy man. He is the author of the 2020 book, Begin Again, which is about James Baldwin and the history of American politics. So Dr. Glaude, welcome. Um, we are, are so happy to have you here. Um, I know that this has been a very busy week for you as I have seen you on MSNBC every morning. Um, and so thank you for, for taking time to be with us today. Oh, I'm I'm so delighted to be in conversation with you, Sister Carmen, and I want to thank Dr. Hall and everyone behind the scenes who are making this possible. So thank you, Sister Becker, and all the folks who, uh, the invisible labor that's making this conversation possible. So I'm, I'm delighted. So let's get to it, right? Let's get to it. Okay, so everyone, this is the book, Begin Again. Um, it came out in 2020, Jane Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. So I'd like to just start by asking why, why this book? Why now? Why Baldwin? Oh, that's such a great question. Uh, in so many ways, I was grappling with my own despair and disillusionment. You know, I had you know, I was, I kept saying to myself, wow, they've done it again. Mm. You know, the fact that the country was in the throes of Trumpism and uh, the hatreds and the resentments and the grievances uh, were all out in the open. Um, and I was like, wow, we're going to have my, my baby. He's not a baby anymore, but my child is going to have to go through this mm. and he's going to have to navigate this. And and all of these young activists who, who risked so much in Ferguson and in Baltimore and across the country, this is the country's response to them. So it was really a kind of a way or response to my own despair. And I knew Baldwin had gone through something similar that after King's assassination in 68, that uh, he fell to pieces. He tried to commit suicide in 1969, and yet he tried to figure out 
or he did figure out how to pick up his, how to pick up the pieces, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, you know, if I'm going through my own moment, let me turn to my man and find resources that mm -hmm. walk with him to think about my moment, to mm -hmm. think about our moment. And that's how Begin Again Immerse you know, came to be. Wow. So what did you, what did you discover as you did that work? Oh, I, I trauma, wound, pain, mm. a kind of bewilderment, love, mm. rage, right? Uh, a courage to tell the truth, mm. right? So, so part of what I, I kept encountering as I'm reading and rereading Baldwin um, was this relentless insistence that we tell the truth about who we are mm -hmm. as a nation and as wounded people, you know, as persons, individuals, that, that the messiness of the world is in some ways a reflection of the messiness of our own interior lives. And, mm -hmm. and so there's this, this honest, Sister Carmen, honest critique mm -hmm. of American society, of how bankrupt this ideology of whiteness mm -hmm. is, how, how the refusal to grow up has, has, has imprisoned this country. And you know that kept ringing in my ear because we, mm -hmm. we see this perpetual adolescence uh, in, in, in mm -hmm. those who are running around claiming Trump and those who um, uh, believe that this nation must remain a white nation in the vein of old Europe. There's something at the heart of it that, is, that, that, that reveals a kind of terror and panic, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there's, so what I found were these, these virtues, these, what it meant to, to, to bear witness on the page. So you have to tell the truth about the wound, to tell the truth about the trauma. You have to be honest about your anger and rage. You have to be courageous enough to tell the truth in the face of the consequences. And you have to love your way, to, you love your way through the mess, through the, through the shit, as it were. You have to love your way through it. Uh, and and still tell the truth. That's that's what I found. I oh. think. Wow, that's a that's a whole word right there. That's <laughs> amazing. Um, let's talk about the trauma because. Yeah. You talk about that, you reference it, you reference Baldwin's trauma that he struggled with, juxtaposed mm. with the trauma that King dealt with, and then also the trauma you even mention about Black Lives Matter activists and trauma mm. that they endure. And um, our country is has been through a lot of trauma, and there it's not just the individual, right, that's doing the work that is experiencing the trauma, but collectively as a community, as a people. And so what, what did Baldwin do with that trauma? How did he navigate that trauma? You know, it's, 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 it's hard to describe, right? You know, in some ways he, he didn't repress it. He, he was engaged in this ongoing navigation of it, right? That is, you know, what does it mean to come of age in a country that despises you? Mm -hmm. To see yourself through the eyes of that country. So Baldwin would say that he hurt many a person because he didn't think anybody could love this ugly woman. Mm -hmm. And you know who told him that he was ugly was his stepfather. Mm -hmm. and people around him, so-called folk who loved him, you see. Mm -hmm. So there, there's wounds and scars that are a part of, of his formation. When you read an essay written in 1985 called Freaks and, and the, I, the, American, uh, the Ideal of American Manhood, throughout that text, Baldwin gives, he doesn't say it explicitly, but you see moments of sexual assault and mm -hmm. harassment and rape where he's the object of, of a certain kind of sexualized violence and as a young kid, so that's in him. And then, and then there's the stuff about what police would do to him and the stuff that white folks had done to him. And, and so trauma is all on the page, wound is all on the page. And the question for Baldwin, because he's, 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 Carmen, he's in that Emersonian tradition, Ralph Waldo Emerson, of trying to figure out how do we imagine a self in this place? 
but he grabs Emerson by the collar and pulls him across the tracks. Hmm. For folk out there who don't know what I mean, the railroad tracks that separate black communities and white communities, Paulson brings him on the other side where, you know, life ain't been no crystal stair. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to imagine reaching for a higher self when the conditions are that of being broken, of brokenness, mm -hmm. you see? So he's fingering that. That becomes the ground for his imaginative leaps, you see? So in our moment where trauma abounds, we're being triggered day in and day out right now, mm -hmm. right? Seeing a 360 view mm -hmm. of what happened to George Floyd from the vantage point of cameras on, on, on pole, light poles to the body cameras of police officers to the cell phone footage of bystanders to uh, the surveillance cameras in, in convenience stores or bodegas, however you wanna describe them. We're getting a 360 view and we're hearing the words, mama, mm. please, mm. begging over and over again. We're seeing young people, they were teenagers, babies, right? Expressing survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out what to do with that pain. Right. What to do with that trauma, you see. You, you guys are in social work. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So, so this becomes the ground for Jimmy. This is the ground for the imaginative leap. Mm -hmm. You can't run away from it. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to run away, run away from it, it terrorizes you, you see. Mm -hmm. There's a line, just really quickly, there's a line yeah. I wrote in, a, in, 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 a, in the witness chapter and begin again, right? That... Uh, in no name Baldwin moved from the image, this is on page 44. In no name Baldwin moved from the image of Dorothy Counts to the events of the civil rights movement and in the shadow of the dead and broken sought to tell a story about the past that would at least give us some sense of direction in an uncertain moment. His, mis his misremembering sought to orient us to the aftertimes of the civil rights movement and to call attention to the trauma and terror that threatened everything. What one does not remember, he reminds the reader, is the serpent in the garden of one's dreams. And then skipping over to 45, these terrors are moving us about, right? He said, I write, the cruel mm -hmm. irony is that the terrors move us about. We dig trenches to redirect the memories and to get them to flow away from us. But like the waters of the Mississippi River, the memories always return, flooding everything, no matter how high we build the stilts. Mm. Got to deal with the pain. Wow. Wow. That's the ground for the imaginative leap. You mm. can't hide it. You got to run to it. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's really deep. Um, and I think about, particularly in the Black community, that's not, that's not what we do, right? Historically, we don't we don't run to deal with the pain and go to therapy. We don't acknowledge the pain. Mm. There's this, as a Black woman, I'm supposed to be strong all of the time, right? So there are these messages that society gives to us. But it sounds like from your book that Baldwin is saying that message is a lie in order to, in order to really understand yourself you've got to know yourself completely and fully, both the good and the bad, both the pain and the joy, both the hate and the love. Um, mm -hmm. And that really spoke to me in this book because I think so oftentimes the message that society paints um, about black people in particular is so contrary to who we really are in our souls. It's so contrary to who we really are as a community. So finding those strengths is, is really important. Um, and knowing that there's strength in the trauma, there's strength mm -hmm. in running towards the trauma is really important. Yeah, you know, the, the nation has to tell itself this lie about us. Mm -hmm. You see, because if it doesn't, if it tells the truth, it's gonna have to come, come to terms with its role. Mm. So Baldwin says in The White Problem, published in 1964, that the, you know, the founders of the country had a fatal flaw, right? They, they thought they were, they were founding this country and they would come, the Christian nation and da 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 but they had to figure out the role of this chattel, the, the role the chattel would play in their lives. And so 
they told themselves that, that these people were not men and women. Mm -hmm. Because if they were not men and women, then no crime would have been committed. Right. And Baldwin right. says that lie is the basis of our present trouble, you see. Right. So we have to tell ourselves the story that, that George Floyd is this big hulking man who threatened to overwhelm these three police officers. We, we have to tell ourselves the story that this nine-year-old who saw it all mm -hmm. can, come on, can come on the witness stand and, and describe, right? He asked him nicely to move his knee. And then he had to move it. Or you hear the echo in her voice of the young girl who was in the car when Philando Castile was killed. Or you mm -hmm. see Alton Sterling's son crying, sobbing as he's sitting in a at a press conference grieving. But you know, we don't believe these are children because you, right. you see Tamir Rice and you think he's 21 years old within two seconds. Right. Right. You see, so there we have to tell the country has to tell itself these lies because that's the only way it can protect its innocence. You see, that's, that's the only way it could be willfully ignorant about what it has done and what it continues to do in the name of this idea that this country must remain a white nation in the vein of old Europe. You see, yeah. I have a question about that. So, sure. you know, Baldwin goes to France to, you know, escape oppressive America, but you write that he says that America was always with him, that mm. always thinking about America, he was always thinking about his position in America. And the census has these statistics that say in 2045, hey, guess what? We're gonna be a minority white nation. And I've heard people say, and people ask the question, will that change white supremacy? when the majority of white people, when white people are no longer in the majority by number? Will that change white supremacy? Or is it so deeply embedded in the fabric of our nation that it will just continue to keep itself going and going and going? Well, we have a historical example, an immediate example, and that is South Africa. Right. Right, if you think white supremacy just disappears yes. because black folk run the country, Right. That's all you need to do is look at who really holds the reins of power mm -hmm. in South Africa. What the business class, who, what do we deal, how do we map, right, the divide between the poor and, and the rich in that country? And how was that established, you see? Mm -hmm. Baldwin was wrapping his mind around this in his last book, published in 1987, entitled The Evidence of Things Not Seen. Mm -hmm. What do we do when white supremacy obtains and Black folk hold the reins of power? And he's thinking about this in the context of the Atlanta child murders, mm -hmm. the city too busy to hate, run by Maynard Jackson and all these black elites, but all of these black babies are dying mm -hmm. right. and nobody's doing anything. Right. Right. So Baldwin wanted to think through that, right? Think about that moment. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that's so important for us to understand is that demographics are not destiny. Mm. That's good. The browning of America is happening and the panic that we're experiencing right now in the country is a reflection of those demographic changes. The, the convulsions in Georgia mm. are exactly that in some ways. The, the, the sacking of the Capitol on January 6th mm. were in, was in part a result of that. But they're not destiny, no, by no stretch of the imagination, right? Mm. Um, because what, we saw, what we've seen in response to what happened in Georgia right. is not only January 6th, but what? 361 restrictive bills in 47 states designed to limit voting rights right. folks. The murder of eight people in Atlanta, six of them Asian, right? The debates around immigration. I mean, all of this is part of the complex web of this racial reckoning that we're, we're facing. So demographics aren't destiny. But I was thinking about that moment you were talking about with Baldwin going over to France. In 1961, he publishes a book entitled Nobody Knows My Name. Mm -hmm. And he has this wonderful line that I always like to go to. He says, in America, the color of my skin had stood between myself and me. In Europe, the barrier was down. 
Nothing is more desirable than to be released from an affliction, but nothing is more frightening than to be divested of a crutch. It turned out that the question of who I was was not solved because I had removed myself from the social forces which menaced me. Anyway, these forces had become interior mm -hmm. and I had dragged them across the ocean with me. The question of who I was had at last become a personal question and the answer was to be found in me. Mm -hmm. And see the important point there, Carmen, is the moment we imagine ourselves outside of the orbit of white folks' expectation of us, mm -hmm. Baldwin says we're talking revolution. So mm -hmm. here he's giving us right some insight that he realized that it's not about navigating what these people said about him. It's not about navigating the internalized sense that they despise me and I see myself through their, their eyes. No, no, no. The real answer to who I'm going to be resides inside me. And mm -hmm. once I understand that, now I'm on the path to really resolve the question. And mm -hmm. that, that scares the hell out of people. Right, absolutely because that, that self-awareness and that self-confidence and those ideas that you are important and you're valuable and you matter, that changes you. You believe those things about yourself, which are contrary to what the world or society is saying about you. It changes you. It gives you a power in a sense, right? So even mm -hmm. if the actual power from the legislature or because you're governor or because you're president, when you have that individual power, you can use that to really affect change. Oh my, yes, indeed, indeed, absolutely. That's great. That's great. Um, you wrote something really interesting. I'm gonna try to find it really quickly. Um, this is on page 90 in The Reckoning. It says, mm -hmm. in interviews with leading magazines on television shows and in speeches across the globe, he had relentlessly deconstructed America's race problem as, at its root, a fundamentally moral question with implications for who we take ourselves to be. Sure, policy mattered, power matter mattered, but in the end for Jimmy, what kind of human beings we aspired to be mattered more. And I am convinced he was absolutely right, especially for our after times. Can you talk about that a little bit? That really struck me. Sure, yeah, you know, um, of course policy matters. We don't want folk lynching folk. We don't want folk disenfranchising folk. Right. Uh, we, want, we don't want police killing us. Right. We want our schools to provide decent education for our children. We want Amen. to have a living wage, decent health care. I mean, access right. to health care. I mean, policy matters. But, but just as we would say that budgets reflect our values, what we value, mm -hmm. right? The battle that we're, we wage goes beyond just simply these policy questions. And it really cuts to the heart of who do we take ourselves to be? That our willingness to, to traffic in stereotype, to stand idly by as we incarcerate millions of people, to, yeah. to watch communities uh, uh, be devastated by a lack of resources. All of that says something about who we are. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and to do so in the name of innocence makes you monstrous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like William Faulkner from my home state of Mississippi. You know, you read Faulkner's The Bear and you can come across a passage where Faulkner's clear about what white folks have done in the South. Mm. He's clear as a Southerner, as a white Southerner, he knows what's happened. But then he says, if you try to force us to change, I will get out in the streets with my fellow white Southerners with my gun and defend it. Mm. So you know that it's wrong but yet you won't do, you're gonna defend it. That makes you monstrous, that goes to character. Mm -hmm. So the question of who do we take ourselves to be is at the heart of the matter. So if you are engaged in this ongoing evasion, Carmen, of the rock that's at the heart of this place, mm -hmm. 
then you can't really resolve it because you, right. you're lying to yourself. Right. And so the question I keep asking over and over again in this moment of crisis, well, what kind of country do we aspire to be? Who do you aspire to be? Mm -hmm. Right? And so I believe we need to enter into a different kind of moral so and social contract with each other um, because they shredded the old one. Mm. And that new moral and social contract rests, at least in my view, on three different legs, right? One involves a commitment to each other mm -hmm. that if you get sick, we got you. Mm. That sickness is not going to devastate you, that devastate your life chances. So we need a medical system that is consistent right. with the medical system of the industrialized world. Then we're going to say that 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 we this contract, our obligation, which if you work 40 hours a week, you can not only put food on the table, you can keep a roof over your head. You can send your right. kids to college. We're talking right. about a living wage. Right. My obligation to you, my obligation to you is that is that every community should be safe and secure. We mm -hmm. want to move away from a talk of law and order where police are where our communities are over policed and and you know and overly surveilled and under under protected mm -hmm. to a notion of safety and security where safety involves the work that you do right social services where where if Walter Wallace's mother in Philadelphia saw her grown son her baby have a mental crisis health crisis mm -hmm. she called 911 they deployed the police and she ended up having to bury her baby a, a, a nine-year-old girl in Rochester, New York, having a mental health episode. Dial 911, they deploy the police. That nine-year-old is handcuffed, thrown into the back of a police car. And you hear the police officer yelling at her, stop acting like a child. She yells back, I am a child. Mm -hmm. Five-year-old, locked up, police officer, handcuffed. The police officer tells the mother, you should beat him. Moving from a framework of carcerality and law and order to a framework of safety and security, mm. broadening our conversation of what it means to live in community with others. Mm. Who do we take ourselves to be? Right. That question is a moral question at its root, which then evidences itself in policy. When I say budget your values, mm -hmm. I'm actually saying defund the police. Uh -oh. Right, right. <laughs> See, people don't understand what I mean. You see, that's what defund right. the police actually means. I right. don't want you to spend 60 to 70% of your municipal budgets on policing. I want you to spend some of that on social health services, on mental right. health services, on right. job training, on education, right? right. Budget, budget your values, but I'm going on and on and on. You get the No, point. I love that's, that. That's that's a good word right there. Um, and I and I think that we need to be having more of these conversations. I think that this idea of you start the book talking about the lie, right? But people don't learn about the lie, right? Unless you are a person of color in America, you don't even know that there is a lie because you've been taught the American dream, you've been taught the American way. And so to change that conversation and to change that narrative and that framework conceptually to say, look, this is a lie. What you've been taught, what you have learned, the history that you glorify is actually not true. And because yeah. of that, we will never be able to move forward unless we start changing that narrative about the lie. Absolutely. Imagine a love predicated on a lie. Mm. Can't, can't last won't last, it'll reveal itself at some point that this person is not who he said he was, mm. right? So if, 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 if the country is based on a lie, that lie always threatens to consume it. Mm. It's the serpent wrapped around the legs of the table upon which the Declaration of Independence was signed. Wow. Threatening to swallow whole the experiment every generation, you see. So I tell folks, you know, you think about the wealth gap. Well, you know, and immediately, especially in the South where we're from, right? There's a sense in which black, the wealth gap is the result of black folk not working hard and not saving. No, that's not true. That's a lie. At the very moment in which the vaunted American middle class came into existence with governmental policies coming out of the New Deal, 
Mm. There was a there was a bargain struck with Southern Democrats, which locked black folk out of right. those policies. So even right. so much, even even so specific, Carmen, that if you worked in the agricultural sector or the domestic sector, you couldn't get certain kinds of benefits. FHA loans, banking, redlining kept us out of gaining access to wealth. Even mm -hmm. those who risked their lives and got the GI Bill couldn't take advantage of the benefits because systemic structures which denied them access to schools and the like, right? There is no reason to believe that the wealth gap did not come about did not come about from deliberate choices, right. from banking to dual housing market, to dual labor market, to segregated schools, to residential segregation, to criminal form, to criminal justice policing uh, policies. All of this has been deliberate. Racial inequality mm. in this country isn't just simply an accident. Mm. It's a it, it's the result of a choice. That's right. That's right. That's good. And that's, that's not a radical claim. It's a descriptive right. claim. Right. <laughs> right. So the only way you're going to resolve it or remedy it is to be as deliberate. Mm. You that's see? So, but that's what I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. What, what does that look like? Right. So Baldwin says, in the last chapter, you write that even in his darkest days, Jimmy believed we could be better. I have to believe that. How can we be better? How can we be deliberate? How can we be better? Well, this goes back to, to Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and you know, it's a strange thing, right? And what I mean by that is this, you can't reach for a higher self if you're not honest with the self that you currently are. You can't leave behind a self unless you accept who you currently are. Mm -hmm. So we become better through an honest confrontation with our own faults and failings, our own sins, right? Our own disappointments. So we have to tell the truth. We have to be honest about how we've arrived to now. Uh, to use lang language that Jimmy used, we have to describe ourselves to ourselves as we now are mm. at the pitch of passion to invoke Henry James in that moment. So we have to tell the truth about what we've done and the dead that we've left in our wake. Um, and that then frees us up. So telling the truth, you know, uh, Brian Stevenson talks about reparations and records. He says, this thing is sequential. First, you got to tell the truth, then you can reconcile. And once you reconcile, now you've set the conditions for repair. Right. So I think part of what has to happen, remember you asked me the question at the very beginning of our conversation, what did I find there? Mm -hmm. I said, I found rage, found honesty, but I also found courage and love. Mm -hmm. And we have to, step into the power of love and love our way to a different way of being together. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy task. Trust me, that's not easy. Um, because I am a social worker and because we have lots of social workers watching, um, this is more of a personal question about you and your work and the trauma that you've experienced, what do you do for self-care? How do you keep going day in and day out, talking about these things and doing this work that is so hard and that is so um, burdensome and, and sometimes hopeless, right? What do you do to take care of yourself? Well, I'm not very good at it. So the first thing I just need to be honest with you, you know, we, we, you know, you got, you feel like you got this calling on you and you just, you just live that calling is the best, the best way you can. Um, I, I try to write about it in the book, in the chapter elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I, I was initially, that chapter almost wasn't written because I was initially going to go to Istanbul and follow Baldwin's footsteps in Istanbul. And I remember a friend saying to me, have you lost your mind? You're a critic of Donald Trump. Are you going to go to Istanbul? You might not make it back. Um, 
and so my editor wanted me to write, uh, to go interview uh, activists. And I said, we're always extracting something from activists. Can I write something for them instead? I wanna write something for them. And so elsewhere is this, this notion that I came up with, right? That, that offers an answer to your question. You gotta find those communities of love. Mm -hmm. People who will love you to death, no matter who and what you think you are. Those, that community of love that allows you to laugh full belly laughs, mm -hmm. right? To eat, uh, to eat, to eat bar, to eat that barbecue and let the barbecue sauce all, of, you know, so that you can just, you know, laugh full belly laughs, eat till you, till you have to unbutton your pants, to, to cuss at the top of your lungs, to rage, and when mm -hmm. you, when you, when your knees buckle, they got your back. Mm -hmm. Who will tell you that you didn't got new? Mm -hmm. I've not knew you when. Those communities of love who will yes. allow you to retreat from the, from the fight, they will then replenish you. And then you can go back in. Then you can go back in, mm. you know? Um, yeah, you got, to have, you got to have your spaces where you don't have to be on. Mm -hmm. you, can just, you can just be you mm. and be vulnerable and fragile and needy and loving. Mm. and love and love mm. if that makes sense yeah. yeah that makes perfect sense that makes perfect sense did who would you say was that community for baldwin oh it varied he had a, he had a small he had a small knit group of folk his family close partners with his brother uh david uh had a group tight knit group in istanbul uh, before he became, you know, before he became really famous in Istanbul, fame was, fame is, is, is a, is a dangerous drug. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it can lead to an alienation of yourself from yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so he had this welcome table in St. Paul de Vance with some folk that, that, uh, that were so special to him. So, uh, you know, but Baldwin was always misfitted, mm. always misfitted. Yeah. What does that mean? You use that word to describe him in the book. What's his, what does that mean that he was misfitted? You know, he stands at an angle to, to the world, right? There's something about his angle of vision mm -hmm. that, you know, he sees the world, you know, in contemporary academic parlance, he's querying every space he enters. Mm. You know, by bringing the fullness of himself into that space, he's going to queer African American politics. He's going to queer African American mm. literature. He's just going to disrupt the standard assumptions. You know, um, and so there's a sense in which uh, Baldwin has this. I mean, think about it. He's out in 1956. Yeah, yeah. He's out even earlier than that. I mean, Giovanni's Room as a novel is published in 1956. Yeah. When I interviewed Angela Davis for the book, she was like, in so many ways, he was just out there by himself. Yeah. Or I used, I love telling this story. He's at an event uh, with the Black Panther Party with Betty Shabazz, and, who's the widow of Malcolm X, and she has her kids there. And uh, uh, somebody who's, who's standing post with the Panthers has an epileptic seizure and starts shooting, and everybody breaks. And Baldwin's on stage, but everybody breaks for, for shelter. And you hear Jimmy screaming, but the babies. Mm -hmm. And he runs and he goes and co covers them. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of this performance of hyper-masculinity, mm -hmm. here is this frail, fragile brother exhibiting extraordinary courage in that mm -hmm. moment, right? But, you know, everybody, for the most part, knew that when he walked in, into a space, it was sheer genius. But you know, he's gonna come at you at an angle, right? So, mis <laughs> I love that misfittedness. If that makes sense, yeah. No, I love that too, and I love that he, I love that he was true to that. And I hope in my own life that I'm always as authentic in every space that I that I make up and that I enter like Baldwin was. I feel like um, he could be 
with his his brother he could be with martin luther king jr he could be with the black panthers he could be in france and he was always very sure that he had something to offer um even if the people weren't ready for it <laughs> even if they yeah. want to receive it but he knew that he had something he knew that he had a gift you know there's something that i keep telling myself you know because writing a book with Baldwin, I didn't write a book about him, I wrote a book with mm -hmm. him, requires a certain kind of, of arrogance, I suppose. Um, but one of the things I learned through the journey, and it's something that I tell myself when I told my kid and my son, and I tell my students all the time is, you know, the world conspires to make you small. Mm. And the question is whether or not you're gonna be complicit. Mm. So the world wants you to quiet yourself, wants you to mute who you are, wants you to be, to, you know, to, you know, to, to shrink, right? You're in your graduate program and they want you to doubt your capacity. They want you to think that you're not bringing talents and skill and imagination to the task, right? They want you to kind of quiet your voice because if, you're, if you bring the fullness of yourself when you enter, mm -hmm. to, enter into the room, you make folk uncomfortable. So they want you to wash your face blank in order to make wash themselves clear of get clean of guilt in some ways, right? So if the world conspires to make you small, the question is, will you be complicit? If you refuse, then what you gonna do? And I always use this example, right? I've been using it as I talk around the country. It's that it's like listening to the introduction to Giant Steps by John Coltrane. Mm. When the pianist hears that first that first lick, it is so beyond his imagination, mm. he doesn't know what to do. Right. So if the world conspires to make you small, and the question is whether or not you're gonna be complicit, your answer should be no, and then you should take giant steps, flummox the world, mm. right? take these major steps, bring the fullness of your being into the space. Mm. Baldwin, born August 1924 in Harlem, grew up not on, in Sugar Hill, but in the hood, in the heart of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Goes to DeWitt Clinton High School, wasn't a very good student, edited the magpie, right? Doesn't go to college, goes to Paris in 1948 and wills himself into becoming one of the greatest writers the Western world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. take, take giant steps. Giant don't steps. make yourself, don't make yourself small. Don't quiet your voice. Sometimes you got to sing off key to be heard, right? Understand the fullness of what you bring to the table. Mm. Right? Amen. That's a whole sermon. Whole sermon. Whole sermon all day. Wow. That was beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you. So what is next? What is what is next? Are you are you planning on writing another book? Are you planning sure. on continuing? Will you go to Istanbul and walk in the footsteps of James Baldwin? What is what is next? Well, you know, I well, thank you for that question. Um, Baldwin fundamentally transformed me. I barely survived writing the book. Mm -hmm. I was drinking too much. Um, he was at, he's an exacting companion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember, I remember hearing his voice saying, well, oh boy, if you're going to write with me, you're going to have to really be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I realized that I was this fragile uh, little boy with daddy issues that the sentences started jumping off the page in mm -hmm. some way. So I have, uh, I have, I have the third book in the trilogy, Democracy and Black Begin Again. And this, this third book is entitled After This, uh, which is really about the choice that we confront as a nation. Uh, and then there's another book. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a kind of memoir of sorts, but mm -hmm. I'm going back home to Mississippi. Wow. And I wanna trace, I wanna go back to certain spots. You know, I'm from the Gulf Coast, the place where uh, you, know, you can smell the shrimp, the salt off the, off the Gulf of Mexico. And, the best seafood on the planet, you know, uh, where you can hear Bobby Blue Bland on a Saturday all day with some really great blues and the like, you know. Um, but I want to write about Mississippi as a metaphor for America. Think mm. to think with 
to think about the contradictions of my home space, of my hometown, which I ran away from when I was 16. Um, so those are the books I got to play. I'm working on too. Um, I got, I got, I got some projects coming. Yeah, you know, That's taking so giant steps, giant steps. I love it. That's so exciting. We we need more. We need more. So keep it coming. Um, it looks like we have one question from sure. the viewers. Um, the question is, how do we imagine a country where we don't maintain our innocence, challenge our own desire for our own innocence, for social work professions innocence, and the nation's innocence, for um, white individuals and uh, bim pop people of color how do we how do we imagine a country where we don't maintain our innocence you know i mean that's first let me just say this i don't want to suggest that i have all the answers because i'm out here struggling just like everybody else to try to figure this out and just because i'm uh, i'm on television and i have these platforms doesn't mean that that what i say is true i'm, I'm out here thinking out loud with you so this is just a suggestion. And I wanna come at the answer by way of an analogy. Mm -hmm. I'm a scholar of African-American religious history. Mm -hmm. And my first book was entitled Exodus, Religion, Race and Nation in Early 19th Century Black America. How these black Christians took on the Exodus story to imagine themselves differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always been struck by is that there was nothing about the condition of slavery, nothing that would lend, lead anyone who was enslaved to believe that their life could be otherwise. Mm. The domination was so thorough mm. and so efficient. There was nothing about being a slave, mm. which led you to believe that you could be anything but a slave, mm. except the imagination. Mm. There's a moment where you could see love in the eyes of someone right in front of you, even though they could be snatched away at any, any moment, but you see love flip through, mm, opening. You hear innocence, the innocent laughter of children who will see unimaginable barbarity and cruelty, but you hear it for a moment, mm, an opening. These fleeting moments that flip by, as it were, become the spaces to imagine otherwise. So when slavery ends, the first thing they do is they start trying, they start walking, trying to find family members that were stolen from them. Did you see such and such? She was in Georgia with me and they sold it to Mississippi. Do you know such trying to find, trying to because love even you know blossomed, bloomed in that under those conditions, wow. you see. Wow. So what does it mean to imagine a new America when it seems like we don't have the resources to do it? Mm -hmm. We gotta look at the moments of breakthrough that flip by. Mm. We know we can, because we see it. Mm. That's all we have to do is to say, this is our commitment to each other. Mm. And I tell, my, I tell uh, uh, my fellow white Americans that, you know, what is your conception of justice? Mm. If you believe that everybody should be treated equally under the law, then you should be fighting for a reform mm. of the criminal justice system. If you mm. believe if you work 40 hours a week, you should be fighting for a living wage. The so one thing you can't do is to think of me as a charitable gesture. Mm. Mm. It's one thing that you cannot do <laughs> is to think about racial equality as a philanthropic enterprise. Amen, yes, yes. It's not something you do for me, it's something we do together. Right, amen, yes. You see, so the answer to the question Hmm. involves a clear articulation of what we care about, of our values, hmm. and a willingness to act on them. Hmm. And imagination is the key battleground because they don't want you to, they don't want you to be able to imagine the world different. Hmm. But you know, there's a wonderful line, Carmen. I know I'm talking a lot. I know I'm talking a lot. No, I love it. Line, there's a wonderful line in Ralph Waldo Emerson's you know, essays. He says, God speak to, speaks to us through our imagination. Hmm. And I, every time I tell my students that, they go, wow. And then I said, well, if that's true, then what is the devil doing? If God is speaking to us <laughs> through our imaginations, then the work, the devilish work that is happening is to what? Close down our imaginations to make us think that the world as it is, is the way the world must always be. Right. 
Wow. No, no, we got to see beyond the opacity of our condition and imagine a new way of being together. That's the way we do it. Mm. That's, that's the way we do it, close to the ground, close to the ground, sorry. So no, that's beautiful. Um, we've got we've got a couple sure. more questions. Sure. I, I'm gonna move us along so we can we can let you go here. Um, this says, have you thought about how you would handle an acquittal in the Chauvin murder trial? Besides cussing at the top of my lungs, um, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, and we are already on a knife's edge as a country. Mm -hmm. If there's an acquittal, we will slip. So we need, we need to prepare ourselves. Let me use another analogy um, really quickly. I'm from the, as I said, I'm from the Gulf Coast and I know a little bit about hurricanes. Mm. And you know, in a hurricane, you got the front of the storm, which will tear up anything, mm -hmm. spawning off hurricanes, I mean, tornadoes and the like. Then you got the eye of the storm, which is the calm where you can come out and assess the damage. Mm -hmm. But the tail is coming. Mm. And it's as dangerous, if not more so, than the front end. So we're moving into the tail of the storm. Mm -hmm. So we need to prepare ourselves and brace ourselves for, the, for, for what is to come. Buckle up. Mm. That's good. Thank you. Um, and the last question is back to Baldwin. Um, what would Baldwin think about Black Lives Matter? You know, I've gotten, I'm, I've, come, I've come to not, um, I've come to be cautious about trying to anticipate Jimmy's words. Um, you know, he, there's over 7,000 pages of writing that, and he probably has something in there that we all could read about that, that, that could give us some sense of his, what he would say about in answer to the question. What I know is what, I, what I've learned from him and what I would say about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. is a slogan that really wants us to understand that it's the real issue is that white lives don't matter more. Mm -hmm. Let me say it differently. Let me say it differently because y'all don't know if y'all heard me. We know we matter. We know we matter. We don't have to assert that. Right. The question is whether or not you think you matter more than others. Mm. So Black Lives Matter is really an assertion of whether or not this country will continue to operate along on the assumption that white people matter more than others. Mm. Mm. And, all, and all that has come in its way, my Lord, my Lord. Mm. So, Oh, blessed are the babies, as Baldwin would, would, would insist. That's why mm -hmm. I end the way I do. I end the book where I begin the first chapter, remember? Mm -hmm. Baldwin talking with young SNCC activists. Right. And then I, I end the book. I'm trying to find Jimmy's grave. And these, these brothers are smoking wolves. And it's the loudest weed I've ever smelled in my life. I'm like, my God, this is powerful <laughs> stuff. And I asked them and I say, well, you know, where is Jimmy's grave? And brother's like, I don't know, but he might be over there by, by Malcolm's grave. And, and Carol Weinstein said, no, no, he's not buried over there. Right. And it turned out that Jimmy was right behind him mm -hmm. the whole time. Mm -hmm. So wherever, whatever, whatever he might think about young folk, you know, that's where he knows where that's where the action. I'm so yes, Absolutely. Um, well, we are finished with with questions. Um, and I just this has been such just an honor, a joy. I, I don't know, a, a life moment. I feel like I can check a box off of my list. Oh, my goodness. Um, we are so very grateful to you um, for for coming to meet with us today for having this conversation, but really just for the work that you're doing for being out there and, and committing to do great work and using your platform day after day after day to really center people on those things about love and justice and hope and um, we're paying attention and we appreciate it so very deeply. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. You.
Um, thank you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Hall. Thank you. Right, thank so you, Camille. First of all, thank you, Carmen and Dr. Glaw, for a phenomenal conversation. The energy was just like fire. I got lots of tweets, lots of text messages in. Uh, I was like, do you have questions? No, I just want to listen to Laura. Like, I'm bothering them by asking them, do they have questions to ask you? But I'm just saying, I just so appreciate everything that you shared with us today in this space. It's very motivating to us. And I really appreciate the fact that you talked about self-care and surrounding yourself with a community of love. That's so, so very important. You also talked about um, white allies and what they could do in terms of uh, supporting people who are in this, who are doing this work. And I am grateful to you and I wish you the best. And Carmen, again, thank you so very much. And thank you to our audience participants. And moreover, I just want to shout out to our College of Social Work and our endeavors for diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is like a dream come true for me. And I'm really grateful to Dean Messenger for having the vision and the foresight to create uh, this endeavor. So thank you all. Be safe and take care of yourself. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.